Shall we begin? Yeah, this is... Uh... <laughs> well, my name is Andre Chumley, and uh, I was born... I'm 56 years old, recently, and I was born in Georgetown, British Guyana at, at that time, now, and then it became Guyana a year later. But uh, those are my stats. And what's the date? Oh, what's February the date? February 9th, 1960. February 9th. We'll have Deb run your chart. Do you know if you were born at, in uh, what time of the day? I, I, I always used to, get, my mom says uh, near 4.30 p.m. was the Afternoon, closest. late afternoon. Yeah, more, yeah same yeah. as my daughter, Noelle, was right about five o'clock. Okay. There's two, two babies going on. They had a thing going side by side rooms. And my water, my uh, my wife's, uh, my ex-wife's water broke the night before. So we've been in there like 20 hours. And they're like, you guys got to go. There's other people there that are ready to drop the kids. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, that took away my next question, which was how to pronounce your name. Yeah, um, Chumley. And where did, Chumley? Chumley. So Chumley. the easiest way to think of it is, is two syllables. C-H-U-M. Yep. L E E Chumley. I just I just wrote it down. So um, it, it it's English. I, by the vagaries of imperialism and colonialism, we a lot of us had English names, and uh, you know uh, British Guiana, and so it's an English name. And later uh, I learned, uh, and especially with the internet, there's a Chumley Castle and there's Chumley Lane, and where are those? <clears throat> all, in, all in England. All in England. All in England. Yeah, uh, English, English slash French word. You know, as as you know, a lot a lot of words cross over with English and French. But it's um, uh, yeah. There's a there's a there's a Chumley horse race that goes on. I mean, if you look it up, have you ever met a Chumley? Uh, not one of the English ones. But my sister and I uh, have a running joke that we're going to show up one day and and, and just <laughs> like burst into a meeting or something and say, "You owe us some money here." What? <laughs> You know, just go really. You and know. is there just the two of you kids, you and your sister? No, actually, I have two sisters. One's seven years younger. The other one's about uh, 16 years younger. Yeah, two sisters. Uh, and uh, my dad got remarried. And and uh, so it's just the three siblings. And at what age did he get remarried? Were you young, high school age? or? Uh, I was young, yeah. He got remarried uh, twice. He got remarried when I was 11. And and um, that was uh, that was the uh, pr that union produced my second sister. Well, that's what I'm going to ask if your sisters are you got one real full blood and one half blood sister, right? That uh, kind of thing. Yes. Well, yeah. One full blood and one uh, mostly blood, <laughs> whatever the term is. But yeah, yeah. And and then um, he yeah he was married a third time later in life, but but uh, no no kids. But you were the big brother during the divorce, you know. I. I... I was actually, you said seven years between your closest sister? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah, my, my sister's nine years. So it was enough that I was actually kind of out of the house. Okay. I didn't really grow up in the same family. She <laughs> did, you know. Divorce also, parents? Uh, well, she's about nine years younger. So if you think of it like, you know, when she's five years old, I'm 15. So we kind of hang and play. But by the time she's like a person like 10 years old or something, eight or 10, I'm gone. I left the house yeah. at 17. I was like, Right. out of here right. so um yeah but i i can kind of remember the hardships on my sisters with the divorce yeah and, and deb and i talk about it because we're the oldest of families of five both oh. of us okay. and the same thing for you being the oldest kid and how did that develop into music and do your sisters do anything in music or um the 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 immediately older sister uh lisa um she's an architect now and she she played flute uh, in in uh, grade school and a little bit of high school, and it's just We're, thinking about picking it up again. And do you did they did you all go to school then, partially in Africa and then come to the states, or when did you come to the states? In, in South America, but um, uh, South yeah, America. I I I slung I slung shot sling <laughs> slingshot. So so the quick slingshot was uh, at about five months old. My parents moved to sh Chicago. Which was a beautiful story and a story of American immigration. And a story With you as an infant, they took you? Five months old, yeah. And, and inoculations? Um, I don't know what you have to have. Yeah, I'm sure all of that. And, and it was a beautiful story of 
of uh, quite affluent families in Chicago, in Highland Park. If anyone knows, that's the pretty affluent A little bit. Chicago. And, and uh, helping us out, helping an immigrant family, helping a, a, a young student, my dad, to go to the Illinois Institute of Technology to become an uh, um, um, industrial engineer. But helping us out, giving us our, our start. We lived with this family for a month. And uh, so I grew up in Chicago till I was about uh, five or six and then went back to Guyana with my parents till I was 11. And so I did go to school there till I was 11, um, from f five or six to 11. Uh, and then uh, moved to Brooklyn for two years, New Jersey for about 30 years, and North Carolina for 14 years now. So, but, uh, so I've been all around. And, uh, but I had the, a couple of things I always give thanks that I, I left the U.S. at a, I left the, 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 um, uh, the U.S. at about age five or six, right when you start eating too much candy and watching too much TV and all that. And it was interesting because um, uh, you can still end up pretty fine after that. But I was lucky that I plunged into uh, back into Guyana where there was just books, radio, and, and kind of... I, I what became, language do they speak? Is, are they speaking English there? It's the only English-speaking... Uh, nation in South America. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, so we grew up, you know, English schools and English books and, and, and various customs and stuff. So, um, you know, I read, um, I, I came back to the U S and I knew all these different books and stuff. It was a little, little culture shock. Um, but, um, yeah, Ghana is in East Africa, just East of Nigeria, I believe. And yes, I, I've, uh, over time, we, we, Guyanese people have a running joke that you and you say it and if you say it quickly or with an accent, people say, "Yeah, I'm from Ghana," and and it's okay. People heard Ghana, you know, and 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 so uh, a number of times in my life, it gets conflated with Ghana, but uh, and where where geographically there's Ghana, uh, Ghana, Ghana, oh. Ghana is just east of uh, Nigeria. Is that Nigeria. what you said? Yeah. yeah. So, and so. is that where I listen to sometimes um, one of my favorite Tory records until somebody said, get this off the bus uh, because it's voodoo music, is the uh, Night Music of Marrakesh, which is from Gowana. Uh, Ma Mar Mar it's a Bill Laswell axiom. Record. Yeah, right, right. Uh, is Marrakesh, is that in Morocco? I'm, 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 I don't know. They call it Night Music from Marrakesh, but when right. I work with uh, it's... Uh, uh, Brad Hauser, Brad oh, Hauser spent, spent time in Africa. Right, he's the one that told me. So oh, this is this is not late night music you listen to <laughs> while you're drinking on the bus. <laughs> it's um, uh, well, it's well, spiritual. It's religious music, you sure. know. Yeah, those those records from all the different spots in Africa are still just eye opening. I mean, there's so many amazing things on that continent. But um, but Ghana, yeah, a lot of wonderful music from Ghana. It's funny, we've been uh. Head over heels lately, uh, uh, Robin and I watching uh, movies and, or shows by this amazing Ghanaian, uh, English Ghanaian descent woman. Her name is Michaela Coel, and she did this. Inc she's got this incredible series on HBO called "I May Destroy You." Oh, um, wow! She's just a great writer, director, actor. And then is she, that a drama or a documentary? It's drama, and it's kind of uh, you know shot in London, East London, and it's uh, mostly African descent, um, young people in Africa and their social life, and, and some dark shit that happens with her. So she's uh, we've just discovered her, and she's got this hit show called Chewing Gum, Chewing Gum, that was also a big hit in Britain. So um, yeah, check her out, Michaela, like Michael with an A, and then C O E L, and she's just <laughs> something else, and and. But brings that Ghanaian history and energy to a lot of her writing, and and uh, so that's been. So tell me better geographically than where you grew up. So so where I grew up is um, South America, uh, the very top of South America. So if this is the South American continent, you know Venezuela here, we're right next to it. Oh, so you're up uh, near the Panama, Panama. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I never, I never knew there was a country there. <laughs> yeah. I always thought you were from the African country. Yeah. No, it, it, Guyana. I mean, uh, uh, South America, it, the tiny ones get missed and the tiny ones at the top, just east of Venezuela are Guyana, um, Suriname, uh, sometimes called Dutch Guyana, French Guyana, 
you know, uh, the little ones that are right there. Um, and um, Trinidad's just off the, the, the coast. Um, but we're, we're dwarfed by Brazil right next to it and all that. So we get sure. skipped over. We get skipped over. <laughs> well, that puts a whole different angle on it. I, 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 I had the wrong continent. <laughs> that, no, that's – this is – this is kind of mispronounced my whole life. And did your dad play music, or he was just he was like engineering was his thing, right? Yeah, uh, he went to make... exactly. He he never played. He always wanted to and tried to fool around on a piano later later on in life. But um, no. But but I give thanks to my dad every day who who passed away. Um, not I not saw a... him on just a year or so ago, right? Yeah, year and a half. So I'm still, you know, going through that journey. Um. But my dad was a music fanatic, and that was really important. I mean, he – so my youngest memories are not only music, but all kinds of music. I mean, so uh, Caribbean music, Calypso, uh, and, and he was a college student in the last five years of the 60s. So Simon and Garfunkel, Miles Davis, Bitches Brew. I would stare at that cover. I mean, as a <laughs> four-year-old, I mean, that cover just – so I give him thanks for introducing me to – uh, psychedelia. I mean, you look at that cover, you look at the Picasso statue in the middle of Chicago, the big horse looking thing. You know, he had uh, Bobby Goldsboro and Isaac Hayes, the last poets and, uh, you know, the Beatles. So it was this mix of all kinds He was of probably pretty young when you were born, right? He was 20-ish? 24, yeah. 24. I mean, so he's a pretty young guy to be that hip. You know, really, he's only 30, exactly. you know, he's, he's yeah. 35 years old at the time you're describing, so... Yeah, uh, or no, well, um, well, even, or young, even younger, 20, even younger, 20, yeah. 20, 28 or something. He was at the recording of Cannonball Adderley of Mercy, Mercy, Mercy with Joe Zawinul. He was yeah. at the show, so so he he just loved. I just heard all this music growing up, jazz and and, and um, everything world music. So that I, I give a lot of thanks there because my first attempts to figure out how to use a record player around five or six you know i i, I pulled things Three. out because of the, exactly it, there was a few scratches but i but i pulled things out uh based on the cover so i remember stuff like isaac hayes hot buttered sold because it was like his big bald head yeah yeah, yeah. I just i just remember these album covers the last poets which that was heavy shit because yeah. I didn't know what they were saying, but I knew these were dirty words <laughs> and, and, you know, quote unquote. Uh, and, and that was early rap. I mean, so I, I yeah, I always give thanks to, to both of my parents. My mom loved music also. Um, so there was always lots of, yeah, Aretha Franklin. And you know, so did they put you in some kind of music classes or arts? Like my mom put me in the summer arts program <laughs> at about age 10. <laughs> it, it's funny I, I wish but i started playing music late i started playing at, at age 18 just because i loved it and, and i i said and you start on guitar or keyboards start, or started on guitar and um it's funny because a direct result of one thing uh was there one thing that made you actually did your friend have a guitar or you saw it sit in the room or you just you, you saw a zappa and you said i gotta find a guitar now i, I got into zappa a, a couple years later but it's funny i i I told this story the other day. I have a, a weird thing where I fell in love with guitars and synthesizers at the same time. And and so I'm sitting in a room with guitars and synthesizers. And let's see. Can we? Yeah, there's a bunch of synthesizers around and, and guitars, you know. So so I, I, I kind of both of them arrived at the same time. And I just I got enamored with the sound of synthesizers. And pretty soon after I discovered I saw an ad for the ARP Avatar. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you, you can make those sounds on a guitar. I, I got to learn. I got to get one of these. So it was very funny. I, I didn't so wait, wait, wait. Tell, tell me then it's as, it's as much about the sonic, uh, the sonic experience as uh, maybe more driven by that than I want to jump on a stage and, and I want to be able to rock out totally. or, or I want to solo. I want to do this, you know, a lot of bending and all that sure. stuff or i just like chord shapes and sure. it sounds like you were more intrigued and myself also i think looking back it was sound i was just intrigued by wow well, well, that sounds like a fire that's, wow that's like that's magic. it no you nailed it. It, it the sound and i uh on the two kind of genesis moments were 
the the shadows. My dad loved the shadows. You know, oh, Robert Fripp too. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And they're they're not as well known in in, in the U.S. I mean, they're kind no. of a cult thing. But in the English countries, again, because of the BBC, and we grew up with. The, he grew up with the shadows, early sixties. So one of his records was the Shadows' greatest hits. Wow. That floored me. Something. Yeah, he played the melodies, much like the ventures and surf music we had here. I, I was so transfixed by the shadows. And then the, so that was Sonic, exactly. And then the other thing, and, and I still love those clean, stratty guitar sounds with all the technology that I have. I still go back to that. And then the other Sonic moment was um, just hearing synthesizers, but Steve Miller had a record, um, Fly Like an Eagle. I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and i remember he, yeah right around the same time hearing that record how it starts with the synth and hearing bernie worrell i didn't know his name at the point at that point on flashlight parliament funkadelic flashlight i just remember being you know 11 and i just said what's this what is this and that's it. That 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 made me become a musician. Those two kind of sound worlds. Um, <laughs> so I think I got sucked in by the camaraderie, you know, of seeing the Beatles and like and Help and stuff. They're all living together. It's like, yeah. man, that's like, you know, almost being like a sports team or you know whatever a fifties gang or or, or or whatever a current gang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that... but your buddies, you know, you got your buddies, your ba your band. Sure. Uh, which uh, I don't think it means that at all anymore in the music industry. A band is not a band of people who grew up and and share the same things. Most often now, it's it's a it's a musical event where you put these participants together sure. and you call it a band. But it's uh, it's not the same as when we were kids growing up. You know, we can have close relationships, but it's nothing like uh, when you were growing up together, five guys having all those experiences together. It, it's it's vastly different, and it's funny because um. Did you have a band? Did you have a band right away? No, first band I was in, I was about so I started actually got a guitar. I was eighteen, and I and I got a, a couple synthesizers right around then also, and I I had a reel to reel tape deck. My stepdad had just passed away, and I had all this cool. He was an audiophile. Hey, so like, when your mom moved, you went with your mom to America. Uh, oh, your dad was in Chicago, so so we moved. The whole family moved Chicago to Guyana. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, yes, Guyana. Chicago back to Guyana when we were um, uh, in 1971, all together. In those ensuing years, my parents broke up. In 1976, my mom packed up the two kids, the little four-year-old and the 11-year-old, and brought us to Brooklyn, New York. Um, she had met a new guy, and, and they were to be married. So I, I cherish that time, too, because I got to grow up in Brooklyn for a little bit, and I got to, to really have that. Uh, I got mugged. Someone forced me to smoke weed. Someone you got mugged at what age? What are you talking about? For my, for my lunch money. Oh, um, it's funny now. I, I got mugged. I would have been like 12. I got, I got mugged on the, on, the, on the subway coming back from church, which I can't even wrap my mind around. But I used to go to church. Uh, my mom, I wasn't I, at all. My mom would send me, and I was coming back, and and these guys accosted me on the New York subway. I was on a car with no one else there, and uh, they didn't hurt me. They, they they took my money. They took whatever it was, five five bucks, bucks or something. Yeah, I can't yeah. much. So, so um, but but um, <clears throat> so at that time period, it was um, this new guy in my mom's life, and and uh, you know um. Uh, he had all this he was a real audiophile and to this day i've got um the bose 9 950 or 905 speakers that is old speakers top, top notch shit that he had i still have it and it's really a testament to how well made that stuff was in the 70s as we know and and again i was so fortunate to to be growing up around awesome sound so i really knew what stuff was supposed to Fidelity. sound Fidelity. Yeah, yeah. So, but how are uh, your ears holding up now? You know, mine are really shot. I'm, I'm. It's it's painful to be around me with like to have a conversation with my wife is you know constantly, huh? What did uh, you say? You know, I'm 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 lucky. You know, I I, I um, 
I just uh, I, I knew to be careful about it pretty early on. And I definitely had some years of you know loud martial amps next to me. And stuff. When did you start to wear hearing protection or did you at a certain you No, know, I, I uh, on some gigs, like when I'm teching for someone I'm on stage with some loud shit once in a while. But I'm 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 not a stickler about it. I just I just go with proximity. I just don't stand in front of speakers. And yeah. and, I, and I've been lucky that a long string of the people I've worked for, whether it's uh, Steve Howe or, or, you know, Greg Lake or, or anyone, um, it's it's not loud and they don't have amps blaring and then they yeah. yeah. So you missed a little of that generation. I missed, I missed <laughs> a little bit, uh, you know. And 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 when I was around it, you know, because I've played in a lot of bands and I've done a lot of heavy stuff and opening for metal bands and stuff. I just was really maybe I'd throw some earplugs in then, or I would just stay off axis. I was really, you know, um, but but it, the, I think my hearing's pretty good, even being next to drummers. Well, when you're the drummer, you're stuck in that position. Um, Tony yeah. brought it up to me one day. He said, "When I don't like the mix, I move." He says, "If I need to hear more of the drummer, I step back. If he's too loud, I step away." You know, and we're stuck. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it, and I can remember growing up usually with with like. Uh, SVT, whatever we call the Ampeg, the, right. you know, the four, uh, eight, eight, ten inch. What's the big guy called? I forget. Yeah. Uh, the Ampeg, the big That's one, like a refrigerator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and and the Marshall stack on the other side. So those those guys were loud, and that I'm sure contributed to my whole approach. Yeah. Uh, uh, to drumming. So bands. When did you get so into a band band? So my the first band I was in, I was I was about nineteen, and it was called Circle of Fifths, <laughs> which is funny um i didn't know what that was now i teach guitar and i teach theory and i teach circle of fifths but um it was this band and i had a little tiny amp and and it was it was a, a weird band we we you played we, cover tunes or original we we mostly original we learned a couple covers but mostly we weren't good enough to to learn Did other you play bars were you playing five five yeah. hour night it's, club gigs because so you usually I, have to learn some covers to do that absolutely so so a big part of my life centered on new brunswick new jersey because i went to rutgers university um uh, for a while uh and um and so yeah we, we started playing in this club in in new jersey which which is a famous club it's called the court tavern and Play things like the early Rollins band and the early, uh, you know, the band Ween. Some of yeah. the earliest, earliest shows were there, and uh, um, you know, uh, all kinds of other cool bands um, started out in this this little club. So, um, but yeah, we would play there and play like coffee houses and stuff. A college town, so there was a lot of gigs like in dorms and parties and things. You, you just... and were your you're playing original music? You said right. So were these like three four five minute songs with lyrics or with these long extended acid jams they, they they um they tended to the longer side yeah yeah and they were it was instinct back because we had kind of a latin percussion thing happening um and then a keyboard player and the keyboard player and i just knew a couple chords that was it and and the bass player was pretty good so he that was a good person to be a strong musician because he led the way on some stuff and we had um uh you know, a female vocalist, um, and and she. How she, long did that stay together? That was uh, a, a year or two, you know. And, but it was looking back, incredibly, kind of. That's what got you onto a stage and into yeah. a into a gig, right? So that exactly. was the transition to oh, I got to unload and plug it in, put exactly. it back together, take it down, get it out again, do it again. That that was it, and and it, I, the I was bitten by the bug, and and. Um, you know, uh, again, there's so much diversity to start out with that I was, we were into Santana and stuff like that. So there was a lot of congas and percussion. The singer, her name was Magda. She was Latina. And so she sang a little bit in Spanish and wrote. And so there was like this cross-cultural thing. And looking back to start out like that gave me some tools to like, okay, there's that direction, this direction. Um, and, and, and the improvisation stuff was, was um, but I like what you said about the, a band is a gang, more or less. That was a strong thing to just know, like, these are your pals and yeah, we're going to do this yeah, forever, you know? You know, I, I didn't actually get mugged, but um, I, I got punched out once. I was about 16 and we were pushing the piano from the music 
room at the high school to the gymnasium where we we're going to do our gig. So there's four or five of us pushing the piano. I saw a dude I stopped to talk to and somebody was with him just out of nowhere took me down completely and I stood up and he did it again. Well, my band guys, they'd already pushing the piano away. So I stagger off and catch up with them. As soon as they saw what happened, it was like a fifties movie, you know, right. the, those two dudes, one had a buck knife and the other had a motorcycle. He was a biker. He had a biker chain, you know, the, the chain came out and they took off to defend me. <laughs> it was like, uh, yeah. The blades, yeah, you know, yeah, it was, it was serious. I didn't, yeah. You're ready to go. I don't carry a weapon. I, I guess the drums are my weapon, but um, no, it's a switchblade. The uh, you know um, yeah. multi tool. Uh, that's crazy. So what was what was the reason? Just being a jerk? I no, I never knew, dude. I think I I don't even. It was I don't even want to get into because it it's so bizarre. It was yeah, two yeah. Dudes, and I knew the one dude, and when I talked to him, the other guy thought I was dissing him or something. I mean, right. I, I don't even know, dude. It came out of nowhere. Yeah, uh, but I got good sympathy because we had three or four gigs that weekend. We'd play a Friday night and then a frat party in the in the Saturday and then a Saturday bar gig or whatever. I was still in high school, but uh, all the college girls that were with the, the rest of the band were all college guys. So, okay. you know, I had a piece of meat on my face for a weekend and had, a, you know, somebody taking care of me. Sure. Just the sympathy vote was was it was. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, when my mom saw it, that was a freak out. She saw me come down to breakfast with this purple face. And like, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So hopefully that won't happen again. But I think that lesson from you on the on the getting mugged there is uh, a lesson when we travel. You know, that's I haven't known you that long. I was trying to think back when I met you. And I think it's 2008. Uh, I think uh, you guys opened for California Guitar Trio with the Zappa project uh, at BB Kings in New York. Am I right? That's when I think I met you. And Pamela Lee of Kirsten, I met the same night. She she played with us that night. That's 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 true. I you know I probably um, I, I I probably said hi to you in a group of. That's why because I was thinking about talking to Deb. I said, when do we meet him? He's just kind of always been there. I'm not really sure. Just, I, I I remember if we met like him. A, we all met him before Adrian. You know, like a we. <laughs> like a bad rash i'm just there well i was no. there was yeah there was that time and and i think before that as a king crimson fan which you wouldn't remember because it was on the sidewalk with six people i think i think as a crimson fan because the first time i saw you with crimson would have been the first time 94 95 you know double trio uh, days yeah yeah and so um some some somewhere i remember waiting online at the, the, the theater you guys played like five nights in manhattan and you and adrian were arriving from the hotel but that's you know that doesn't count that's like 20 people standing there but but our first real conversation sure bb kings california guitar trio and then later in 2008 we really hung because we were in kazan tatarstan yes <laughs> so, yeah with i didn't realize that was the same year that was a very active year for being wow. basically sort of just grabbing every gig that, that came. Uh, that Kazan gig was really bizarre be in a way for me because as a drummer, I would have liked to have had some better gear, but I, I just accept the fact it's back line. It is what it is. You get an hour sound check, piece, piece it together and, and play <laughs> your stuff and get off. And then you guys show up. I, I, did you come with Eddie or ELP? You might have come with both. No, it's funny. It, that's funny because out of that, I got both of those gigs. I I, um, I was there with Adrian Ballou Trio. Oh, well, the those guys brought a ton of gear. That's what I was going to say. I don't we, know how they swung it, but uh, they had modular... Adrian? Oh, 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 Emerson, yes. Emerson, I mean, and also uh, no. Eddie, he got them to bring a massive keyboard rig and all this stuff over, you know. It's yeah. like I couldn't even get my cymbals brought over. <laughs> at that, yes, at that point, he was using, like, profits as controllers, which is a wild idea. So he had those. He had a, a couple of racks. He had all You're this talking stuff. about Emerson, right? No, Eddie Jobson. Eddie Jobson oh, had all Eddie had a custom thing. He had a custom keyboard he brought over, didn't he? Am I wrong? Yeah, yeah. No, it was, a, it was something they, they uh, spent a lot of time and money to make, and it died on the first or second gig. You know, it, it locked up. It was we, a big controller. We went back another time. Wasn't there like a, a Crimson weekend with that same promoter? Right. It kind of was the same weekend. He, he managed to stretch one gig into. To keeping us there and putting us here here and right. there and then, and then calling it a festival right we were in moscow and then the place called pirm 
and, and all that. So, yeah, I'm a little cloudy because, um, <laughs> no, because the second it was like Yeah. Oh, man. The second time I was working for Eddie, the, the second time we were all in Russia, and I know you were there for that one, too. So I, we might be mixing those. But the first time around, actually, Eddie was kind of a floater in Perm, in uh, in in Kazan. He had his he was he there. came he came as a bonus guy. That's right. He was, he was set in to make his debut with exactly. it wasn't even Adrian Ressa. It was another act. No, he he, he kind of sat in. He sat in with the big jam with Patty Smith and everyone. I thought he sat in with with you guys with K two. Didn't he not? Well, he, no, he he might have, and he also sat in, I think, with Adrian. But I think there was yep. another older British group that he was. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, 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 Fairport, Fairport Convention, Convention or something. Fairport Convention. Yes. Um, Who, and it, I think. Yeah. You know that was that was the main gig he was going to drop. You're on correct. Stage. You're correct. He and and that one where he really he learned ten songs again and did. Yes, you're right. But then the promoters kind of said, "Hey, you know." people from King Crimson, people from Zappa. Why don't we, you know, and so he did show up a bunch of times. But that that was a great trip on, in so many ways. What a wonderful place to be. It was so like, let me step back. What yeah. was your first gig as a as a tech or a, a crew guy or sure. wherever you were? Sure. So, so Ray, Adrian or before? Uh, before that. So racing ahead, 80s, 90s, played in a bunch of bands, started this, the New York, New Jersey area. Started, hey, on any of those bands, did you chase a record deal? Yeah, one of them. One of them was a group called um, False Virgins, and I was the bass player in that. And we actually we were on Breakout Records, which was a, a, like a subsidiary of, of Enemy Records that had Sonny Chirac and The Last Exit and all that. So we actually had this um, this budget in this New York uh, um, uh, record company with, with the real address and all that. And I did this one record with False Virgins um, that um, Bryce Goggin produced, and he went on to do all kinds of amazing stuff. I don't know him. Yeah, very proud of that record. If people go on on Spotify or YouTube, it's it's False Virgins Infernal Doll, and it's kind of power pop punk rock with just really great lyrics. The 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 singer was this. He, he's passed away. David Aaron Clark was this great author. He was an editor at Screw Magazine and all this stuff. So we were pretty happening. We were doing these gigs in New York and these, you know, real cognoscenti New York downtown people were showing up. Um, and the, the album started taking off a little bit in Italy, of all places. We were getting fan mail. It makes sense in a way. Yeah. yeah. And and then it just went south. The drug problems with the singer, the dot, 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 dot. She committed. And this was mid-80s? This was this was around 90. This was, so that's that's kind of... The first time I had something that was, uh, I was part of a band. It was Dave's band. But it was the first time I was part of a band where it was like, oh, wow, okay. Meetings with record label people. And, um, you know, Lee Ronaldo from Sonic Youth was involved with one of the songs. Elliot Sharp is on the record. It was really, you know, it was exciting because it was like, wow, you know, this is, you know, is something going to happen? So that was my first time, you know, um, in that realm. 80s, 90s, playing in a bunch of bands of my own, playing in different things. And to answer your question, uh, started my Zappa band and started touring with some of the Zappa. You started that? The Project Object thing is your inspiration there? Yeah, yeah. That, that's my band. It started out of, I used to do a Frank Zappa birthday party at my apartment in New Brunswick, New Jersey, on around 89, 90, and just have people over, smoke some weed, some, some a keg or whatever and listen to frank zappa for 24 hours that was the weird twist so wow. yeah yeah so so it would go on all night and there'd be people on the couch at 3 a.m and someone else would wander in after work and we listened to zappa for 24 hours so i did that a few years and and then the third year i said to my bandmates at the time i had a band called zen pajamas and i said we should learn a couple zappa songs for my party Wow, wow, wow. So so we took like the easiest blues riff Zappa tunes and learned a few songs. Unbelievable response. People freaked out and we were like, wow, this is Freak cool. out. Freak out. So the next year we said, let's learn fifteen songs, or whatever. And the my house was packed. It was you know, I was like, This is a thing. This is around nineteen ninety. And that was it. I started doing some gigs. I had met Ike Willis back in eighty four on tour and, and kind of stayed in touch with him brought him in and the rest is history we had an actual frank zappa 
you know, lead. Yeah, I thought he started the project. N no, he was just he he launched us to the next level. Uh, so 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 jump ahead seven eight years of I, I out of thin air and just doing it. I became a tour manager for my own band, and I had to learn all the ropes: renting the vehicles, f plane tickets, flying him in, hotels, taking care of eight nine people on the road. Well, settlements, settlements. A lot of that stuff is kind oh. of doable. I mean, I feel like I could. I mean, I do. I book these things, but the settlements. It's like I don't want to come off stage and then deal with some guy that doesn't. You know, want to I learned so much. I learned to keep the money on stage behind your amp. You know, I learned all these things. So I had a beautiful uh, uh, looking back uh, and also the, the, the den mother stuff, like keeping people, you know, on track and, and, and identifying, you know, you know, uh, uh, jobs for people on the road and, and just being. What do you mean by the dead mothers? Was that a, a second band that was going? Oh, sorry, de den mother. As in, oh, den mother, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. You know, like chemo. Maybe, Some, when you have someone like chemo in the band, exactly, yeah. But, but you know, I, I tell people all the time because people ask me, you know, I'd like to get into tour managing, and I tell them right away, you're a babysitter, you're a psychologist, and 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 a couple other things, and you, you not to the fourth or fifth thing that we get to, okay. And here's the music business stuff, you yeah. know. There's really you have to have such patience, resilience. You have to be able. You have to be Switzerland. You're often negotiating yeah. between two people in the band or the the sound person and someone. Yeah, bass is too loud, and everybody's going to get you know, pissed off. And so I had I had all these years of doing that, and and so to my to my first pro gig. So I'm I've, I've toured for a while now. I've been across the USA and into Canada. And I um, but not outside to Europe or South America. Not yet. Not yet. And we did a gig with um, a, a sold out at Irving Plaza in New York, a, a cancer benefit on Frank's uh, on Halloween. And it was for, for prostate cancer uh, in honor of Frank. Had sadly, been taken by that a few years before. And we do this gig and all these Zappa guys are there. Napoleon Murphy Brock and Don Preston and, and Billy Mundy and, and Bunk Gardner, Roy Estrada. It was amazing. And right after this show the mothers the older guys were about to do a tour and it was chaotic they had nothing was planned they didn't have a van rented they didn't know where they were and i'm talking to them and i'm like you know guys and a light bulb went off and i said wait a minute i've done this for almost a decade for myself this is cake do it for someone else because i don't have to learn two hours of music <laughs> and just and that was it so 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 my first pro gig was with uh the four or five guys from Zappa, the, the mother's guys, Don Preston, Bunk Gardner, Billy Mundy, Roy Estrada, uh, and Ken Rosser, wonderful guitarist. And so I, I, I picked up the pieces for them, did all the, you know, got the, the van, the hotels, advanced the gigs. They needed gear. They needed all this backline. And that was it. And, and, and in quick succession, about a, about a year, about two or three years later, I was – working at the school of rock which is another thing i've done i've taught are you working there I, I taught, yeah i taught at school of rock for a year and is um, that the one in philly i i no i was at the one in Nor one of the ones in north jersey okay. but i when i'm old friends with some of the early people of school of rock eric svalgard the keyboard player in project Cosmic, for a while had the the second ever branch in philly and then in wilmington and the guy who founded it paul green is an old friend so I was kind of, you know, early on. He, he, he founded it in Philly, right? Philly was the first one? First one was in Philly. And eventually, how many were there when they oh, were at their well, max? You know, I, I think he sold it a, a decade ago. Oh, okay. But I think I think there was 40 or something when he sold so it. So dozens, dozens. Of yeah, them. now okay. there's, there's a lot more. So I'm teaching and... Uh, and what are you teaching? Guitar or synth or I'm, sound or I'm actually, road manager or... I, I would I would teach kids yeah guitar I teach some guitar and bass parts but I mostly ran rehearsals which which encompassed so, so the kids would break out into individual lessons and have their weekly lessons one of the things I did was run rehearsals for shows I did the Rolling Stones show and the ACDC show so here I am eight ten kids a clipboard you know Susie singing the first song Johnny singing the second one Michelle's playing bass on this so you have this rotating thing. So it's kind of stage managing too. I was 
being trained. And Did you also talk to them about how to make a set list? Totally. Like, you, know, you got to start good. You got to end good. You got to all of that. Peak in the valley and all of pay that. Attention to your tempos and your keys and everything. For Stop. Traditional pieces that you can add. All of those things. And as, as cool as shoegazing is, you know, even walking the kids through a stage thing, like Johnny, don't don't sit there like this. You know, look like you're enjoying it. Have some fun. So you're training these kids in performance, in in. Uh, tuning up before the damn show, just all these things, the flow of a set, all the things you just said, and, and then uh, and also um, fixing any musical, you know, having a guitar nearby and saying, yeah, that that's that's a C sharp minor. Let's let's guys, let's go back to the bridge. Can we, you know? And so you you have to do this. So I'm doing that. It does take time at rehearsal to have somebody if you don't have a leader per se. It's just, you know, there's somebody that says, okay, we need to run these four bars over and over and over. It, totally. And then, but a lot of times people don't want to run the bars that are the trouble. <laughs> it's exactly. like, let's, let's fluff over that and we'll talk about it later. Yeah, just let me play the route. Learned all that stuff. Um, and it was interesting because I already had been in bands for many years, but this that was a real, that took things up quite a bit. So we're, we're hanging out on a Friday night. The, the, the ACDC show is that weekend or something. And we're just hanging out, a couple, a couple of the uh, teachers, and the kids were all gone. We're having a beer. And, hey, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I've got a gig. And, and one of the guys, a guy named Roger Retort, says, yeah, I'm supposed to do this thing, but I'm, I'm too busy. And he turns to me and says, you should do this. You, you're a touring guy. And I'm like, well, what? He goes, I'm supposed to do this thing for Al Demiola, and, and I, I, I'm just swamped. I, you should. And I'm like, whoa, that's that's." That's crazy, man. I, I remember now. And he's a hardcore guy, right? I've heard he can be a little difficult. From, <laughs> uh, not from you, but from other common touring people. Sure. That had to, to he, drive him to a special hotel a long way away to bring him right back, to take him right back to do this. And to, uh, he, he's, a, he's a legend for sure on, on all those things. And, and so basically, uh, long story short, I drove home going, you know, should, I, should I make that phone call? And the next day I said, what do I have to lose? Had a phone interview with his assistant, Susie Doherty, who's still a dear friend of mine. And she said, well, come on down, pack a weekend bag, bring your passport, and, and we'll try you out. I will try you but out. This is just a one-off gig they were going to try you. They said, let's try you out and let's see what happens. But but bring bring three days of clothes just in case. So I show up in Long Island. Uh, you know, uh, He wasn't there yet. The other band members helped me. And, and finally, here comes Al Demiel. I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, holy shit. You know. I mean, at that point, I grew up listening to his music and all that. Uh, he hired me, and I ended up, uh, he said, did you bring your passport? I said, I did. He goes, you're going to Canada tomorrow. Whoa. All, yeah, all of a sudden, I was thrust into this world. So I stayed with Al for a year, and I still rank that one of the greatest years of my life in my career, which is now, uh, uh, you know. And how big a crew and how big a band would he have had? Like a four-piece band, he, he had, band, keyboards. He had a five-piece band. Yeah, Mario Parmesano on keys, Gumbi Ortiz on percussion. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, oh man, uh, um, you remember Ernie, the drummer? Yeah, Ernie. Uh, forgetting Ernie's last name, Ernie Adams on drums, uh, and a guy named uh, Andy Galore on bass. That wasn't his real name, and uh, and that was but it. Were you the only crew guy? Just you? Myself and my dear friend Mike Renna was the front of house guy and did some other things and um uh and that was it so it was the small little crew uh the two of us <laughs> and and it was the kind of band where uh, gumbi ortiz who's still a good friend uh you know him the percussionist uh, I, I i'm not sure i might have to okay. see his name in print yeah. or see a picture he he's he he's the guy to write the book of, uh, on the, of the history of al de because he's He's been with them for 30 some years. So he, he's really, and Gumbi Ortiz, I give so much credit because he, yes, Al is, uh, what, what are those things where you put a quarter in and it's a bull and you're riding it, you know, <laughs> right? Remember those? Fucking Bronco. Yeah, yeah. Th that's, touring without Al is pretty much that. And, you know, um, uh, I give thanks though, because if you can make it on that fucking Bronco, it's all downhill. And I was going to quit a number of times. And, and I give. I was, I love, you'll enjoy this. This was Jeremy yeah. Stacy's gig when he when Jer Jeremy came into the band and uh, people had warned him that, that Robert could be difficult. Our, our <laughs> Robert Fripp. 
and he and he just finished working with uh, Gallagher. I don't know which one, but Flying Birds. You know, he says I've done. It can never be more difficult than this. Is, yeah, this is easy. Um, s- sidebar. Um, I'm I'm writing a book, and 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 I, I sorry, I always forget to plug things. People can find me on social, right there, on Instagram. At guitar tour. Guitar tour. guitar tour. That's right. At guitartour.net. That's my site, and so uh, Instagram. Twitch, Twitter, that's where you can find me. So um, and that's funny because I was trying to find your last name so I could figure out how to pronounce it and I went to your or how to spell it uh, and I went to your email address and it's not there. Right, right. Uh, it's, it's funny. Andrew oh, at, at guitar Andre at guitar tours. I should I should put a um a phonetic on on the on the on the um on the thing. But yeah, nothing's worse than Biff. Oh God! Oh. Um, uh, so so, but sidebar: I'm writing a book, and and the the first page of the book is going to be a quote from Robert Fripp because I met him years later working for Adrian. He came over to drop off an amplifier, and Aid had, was running some errands. He said, "Robert's going to stop by in about a half hour. Please help him take the." Oh yeah, yeah. So he shows up. Car pulls up. He gets out. He goes, hello, I'm Robert. And uh, and, uh, and uh, I said, yeah, I know. Yeah, good to meet you, Robert, the entree. And we're talking for a minute, and Robert Fripp says, what's a nice gentleman like you doing in the music business? <laughs> I just, I fell out. I was like, wow, well, th- thank you. But um, but but that's, uh, but, but, but jumping back, though, to the, the Demiola year, I learned so much in one year. The first year I'd work for someone outside of the Zappa world, I was in Canada the next day, way up north in a copper mining town called Runaranda that I've never heard of. We flew in a little two prop, prop yeah, two prop plane into Canada, where where the the pilot walked over. Um, we're all standing on the tarmac with all our gear and amp heads and stuff, and the pilot comes over and starts lifting stuff up and checking to it. Load up. it? To, to check the weight and i'm like wait that there's got to be a better way you know he's like yeah that's heavy enough and that's and we get on this plane and and while we're waiting al is whistling peggy sue by buddy holly and yeah. So, yeah. so that's the kind but, of but tell me something here because this is a joke mostly between tony and i but some other people as well tony always says lift my bag because i I'm pretty good. I know where that 50 pounds you know, limit. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, I, I, looking back, uh, it was a moment of terror. But I'm like, come on. Later on, I was like, the pilot had that down to the kilogram. I mean, you know, he. I'm knew. within a couple pounds usually. Yeah. I can tell. He, he uh, knew, and, but but that year took me to Chile, to Israel, to Poland, to wow. to. to uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. Too. And were we on, like Europe was still not the Euro, was it? Uh, what year are you talking about? Yeah, it about? was. This is 2000. Uh, oh, yeah. 2006. You didn't have to deal with interdenominational. Totally. Uh, totally. You know, but, but what was, changes. yeah, what was still wonky was um, cell phones and, and email. You know, I mean, that was around, but, but it was still a flip phone. I mean, we don't realize how recently, you know, uh, things. A changed. smartphone. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean, uh, you know, Poland and and uh, Portugal, my first time touring in South America, you know, just just one or two dates, but in one year he packed so much work, uh, and I will say, yeah, I was gonna quit a couple times. I, I was, but but Gumbi Ortiz would take me under his wing and and talk me through the rough stuff, and and Susie Doherty, who is still his office manager, his assistant, his right hand woman his some booking agent sometimes does she handle other acts or is she just full-time out full-time out and so <laughs> she also is an amazing human being because look he's he's a handful um um and i always tell people because i get this question a lot so i'll say it again he's complicated he he also can be the most kindest wonderful hilarious guy and he can make you fucking crazy also and you want to jump out of a 10th floor window. I'm not kidding. Those two extremes. And um, But I always say that um, if if you were him or any human being, you're 18 or 19, you're practicing at Berkeley, you're living on ramen, and the phone rings, and it's Chick Corea. 
and three days later, you're playing 25,000 seat arenas and you never got off that rocket. You're not, you're not going to, he never had to kind of grow up from 18 to 25 and pay the bills and, and have an apartment and, and kind of, you know, deal with human beings on a certain level. You know, he, he, yeah. he became one of the most famous guitar players. I'm not excusing any stories people might have, but just saying that he's in a different world. And and the the other thing I'll say uh, uh, about Al, um, and, and we're, we're friends, and I, I see him every bunch of years live. I've never worked with anyone who practiced as, as much. That guy had a guitar um, in the hotel lobby, waiting for the bus, waiting for the van, on the bus, in his hotel room, backstage, at the gate of an airport, at the restaurant while we're waiting to get seated. I mean, he's just sitting there. And, and and not like in a boring kind of shredder way. He'd be writing stuff. He'd be playing, you know, j just sitting there and, and, and just as fast as he could play. Sometimes he's just, he's just working on something quiet and beautiful that, that was going to be a piece later. So I always, I, I had so many lessons from that first tour. And then racing ahead, I started working for Adrian right after that was um, that after al that was the next gig immediately after so i'm going like wow this is a trip from al Demiel to adrian Ballou. and how was the connection there but how did how did that happen adrian played at the zappanali the big festival in germany yep. and my band yep. was there and um i just ran into him i had met him many times um just as a fan going back to 82 or three or something and i said hey man good to see you again hey i'm now doing tour support i'm a tour manager i i'm i've learned how to tech and stuff so if you ever need someone oh yeah well great well, you know and we we have ken so we're good tragically ken yeah. passed away. like months later i get this phone call and and here we are it's 15 years later i still work for adrian and then i went on to you know um at, at the kazan thing i met the guys from keith emerson so i got hired there emerson Lake. i thought you were already with them all that time <laughs> We, we were just pals. We just met there and we were hanging around the whole 10 days. So it seemed that way. But but we've hired each other. Uh, I met Eddie Jobson again on, on that thing and ended up working for him. Three months later after Kazan, he calls me and says, hey, what are you doing in January? And uh, that would have been the gig Stickman Open. That was possible. It wasn't really our first show. We had gone to Poland and had a few rehearsals and gigs, but uh, it was our first uh, sort of public Exactly. And, and that, that was a huge gig for me, too, because that was my first time being a production manager on such a major. So, we, yeah, New York City Town Hall. You guys opened up. Um, wow. That was a heavy. That gig put a lot of these. Great we actually, now that I think about it, uh, Marco played guitar on Larks, too, didn't he? Marco, I played drums and Marco jumped to guitar and Tony sat in. We did something yeah, like that. Right. Yes, you're right. You're right. There was a. So that was an exciting time, but it really, and I always tell young people, again, I get this question from time to time, and I say, you know what? Um, figure out how to run your band and really do it and do all the things I just said. Rent the vans, get a credit card, get learn how to Make buy the t-shirts. Make the t-shirts, learn, go sell the merch, learn the whole 360. And I said, do that before you try to go work for someone else. A lot of people think you can just go do it. And, and, and then the second thing I say is um, uh, be on time, be sober, and do, do more than, than you're asked to do. You see something wrong, fix it, because that's what leads to the next gigs. I mean, when, when Eddie Jobson reached out to me in uh, late 2008, it, it's because I helped his tech a bit. His tech was a studio guy and wasn't really certain on some stuff, and I, I just ran over and they were using some equipment I knew and I said, hey, and Eddie remembered that. Okay, this guy is, is he knows what he's doing. He's helpful. And, and so as I look back, and, and uh, especially after a year of being off the road, I realized, wow, one thing leads to the other. You know, my, my, my long running gig with Steve Howe, same thing. You know, his tech, you know, uh, um, his, their monitor guy, I worked with him on another gig and just remembered. So, so I always tell people that's, that's the advice. Don't be a dick. <laughs> show up on time i love i, I always quote tony because robin and i say it all the time on time tony levin time is at least 15 minutes before the time right 
Yeah, Tony's Tony's early. I'm usually early. So you have a whole band, and Robert's usually earlier than any of us. So sure. Crimson is a band. If the bus call is one o'clock, the bus may leave at five to one. There you go. In fact, we've had some moments with Dave Salt, uh, Bill Rieflin, and I when we got left behind, and we're like, we're fucking early. If you you know, you can tell us a different time, we'll be on time. Yeah, we're down there three minutes early, and you guys left ten minutes early. You know? Yeah, it's, it's not cool. Good. Not cool. Not cool. Not no. when you got an hour turnaround time and you know stuff like that. So yeah, um, yeah. But, and you, uh, you may. I got to tell you quick that you please. flash something here. You know, when we started just now, you're putting your jacket on, okay? And then you're just talking about making this transition or telling people, um, moving within the the uh, tech world and stuff like that. Do you know my good friend Paul Mitchell? Paul I Mitchell, Big Paul. He's mixed uh, live sound with. Uh, Joe Sample and David Sanborn. He did a lot of work once he connected. Is his name Patrick Rains, the manager? Maybe he connected up with that. He was my drum tech with the Misters. Very good engineer, very good bass player, very grubby guy. Grubby guy. Just kind of had the kid rock look even before there was kid rock, you know? And he's saying, you know, how, how do I, you know, I should be mixing out there. I should be, I can mix better than the, this guy. I said, dude, they're, they're not gonna, you gotta, gotta clean up your act, you know? Just a little bit. The manager, he just sees you as that backline schlepper guy, you know, and yeah. and it, it didn't click. It was a day or a week later we were in Atlanta because he's a big guy. Paul's like six five, big guy, and he called me says take me shopping, and he had found a big big guy shop in Atlanta. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, and first thing I said, let's get you a sport coat. Even over a t-shirt, a sport coat, you you've just, just upped your game. Just, and it wasn't long at all. He moved to mixing to being the road manager, you know. Huge. So no huge 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 lesson in life and. And even for flying, you know, uh, Napoleon Murphy Brock taught me that years ago, like, get get it all together for the flight. And he shows up, you know, buttoned down, nice jacket. Psychologically, you know, if you're there with some torn up T-shirt and jeans, you're treated a certain way. It's not right. No one's endorsing it. But but the whole vibe changes for TSA if it looks like you're a business. Yeah. I hate that that's true. But but yeah. you know, uh, you, you, so depending on, on things you add that in and now that's how you spot the air marshal right the guy in flip-flops and the hawaiian shirt is <laughs> right. probably the cop wait a minute yeah yeah that's you know yeah and for those hawaiian shirt guys that's a whole other story <laughs> i can't believe when i some of the things that happened in the news the last few years uh that's we true. probably shouldn't even talk about in this domain but there's the man. whole there's the whole uh right the hawaiian shirt guys right aye, aye, aye. yeah say no more <laughs> So uh, how did you make it to the Yes Camp? Was that a connection through Adrian or what was that? So uh, uh, Simone Angelini, the um, the monitor guy, uh, brought me in. And I'm trying to remember when I worked with him. Oh, um, yeah, because. Uh, and do you mix sound too? Are you ever doing front of house? I, no front of house. I, I, Only I, if you really get stuck and you have to run out there, you could deal with it. But you know, a, a ve in a club gig or something like that. Yeah. Um. And I've certainly uh I've jumped on monitors on on a an analog board. I'm fine on monitors. These new boards and, and they're not that new anymore. But but the, these uh, intelligent computer driven Yamaha uh, um, boards and, and the stuff that's happening now. Wow. Um. But um, yeah, an, an analog uh, uh, monitor desk I'm comfortable with, um, a, you know, a club size front of house gig. And, and on Adrian's gig, I've had to do that many times, run up front and kind of say, dude, what are you doing? Do you, you ever know? have to, you have to have to put the whole drum kit together, a rental backline kit, and the oh. guys are going to show up late. So you got to put a kit and position sure. it and tune it and make it ready to walk in, have it mic'd. Yeah, yeah. T Tobias, I would, um, if I was there before him, I would I would generally get the set going and, and he would fine tune. But yeah, I, I can, you know, put legs on, change heads, put put a drum set together, um, know which cymbal stands go where. Um, yeah, I love it when one of my buddies uh, wasn't a drum tech. He was a monitor guy doing these. Very good monitor guy, Daniel Young. But he, I came in, my hi-hats were upside down. <laughs> right, right. Thought, well, how, how, what, what made you think that the hi-hat would go on the clutch and be like that and he said well that symbol and there's a china symbol i had that was upside down upside down china right but he put all the symbols upside down he didn't right didn't right and, and it even says on the i had top and yeah but, true but it doesn't say face up or face right, down. right. that's true <laughs> that's true um the um I, I had to i had to set up um 
uh, the, a couple years ago, I, I toured with uh, 10 Years After with original drummer Rick Lee, and I had to – that was that pushed the envelope, man, because Rick, Rick's great. It was a great tour. And, yeah, it's very odd to me. A few years ago, um, in an interview, a guy cited him as asking if he was an influence on me. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I didn't even know his name. Uh, yeah. I mean, I saw him on the Woodstock. Thing. Sure. I mean, and I like that. Uh, what was the one big uh, we love to change the world? Yeah. Love to change the world was a big hit. Great. Oh, yeah. you know what? You were in Mexico with him. That's when I saw you. That's right. That's great. Great. Memory. Your gig was the next night and we were leaving. Yeah, that was great. Memory. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, but Rick was great. And what was cool about Rick is I had, I had to completely set the setup and uh, had to get back line in six different places, which, as you know, can be crazy. And he's very specific which is fine i'm fine with that that's why we're here but i mean some of the stuff was hard to get and and his setup you know down to the millimeter and so it was my you mean rick 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 lee yeah yeah wow. and, so, and he had I and, think that be that specific to i it. know right but he's actually this this jazz influenced really you know um proficient incredible drummer rock guys as you know get lumped in like yeah you don't know what's happening Rick is like a jazz guy, and he's he's still studying. He would have a book and work on rudiments, but he the, the the twist to his rig, yeah, the twist to his rig was three hi hats, three sets of hi hats. So we had with pedals. Yes, we had the regular. Well, well, one of them was locked on on stage right. That was locked, uh, and and then he had um, uh, one of those long extension cables uh -huh. for the second uh, hi hat. Uh, uh, Pedal. Yeah, those are a pain in the ass. Those oh, long cable hats. I hate those. And 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 the backline people, they'd send the wrong one. It wasn't. Long oh yeah, they can be too long, too short, and they're they're they don't play well. Yeah, and and you know, I, I'm kind of a I come from the punk rock DIY school, so my sometimes with stuff like that, I'm like, dude, we're in the middle of Virginia here. Look at this gig. The guy doesn't. He just doesn't have it. Andre, make sure. No, it's unacceptable. And so I'd send people running guitar center 20 miles away but but there's a lesson there promoter fucked up we asked you for these three hi-hats setups you yeah. gotta get it and 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 um we try to specify on the writer if you can't get it just contact us and let yes. us know yes. we can make arrangements we can change a set list Absolutely. you know whatever we have to do but there yeah there was a bit of that but this this was one of those gigs where, where we were told everything was going to be there that's the worst right where you're told oh yeah, yeah all here and you arrive and it's like are we in are we in genoa yeah nothing yeah. Port portugal was stickman it was like oh my god this is what they brought down <laughs> so um but but yeah, so so drum teching, you know, um, bass teching, guitar teching. I'm not a luthier, but I can do basic stuff on, on these instruments. You know, change pickups and and you know, uh, do do a little bit of fret, you know, work and uh, change a nut, you know, things like that. But not a luthier though. Um, and then I've done the the outs most outside one is probably the Eddie Jobson gig because that's all software, and that was another kind of revelatory thing um three macbook pros synced up uh, with with cat5 with, with ethernet this uh, is the rig he tried to bring to kazan uh i think so kazan, no kazan was still just just a okay. rat, and he had he was using digital performer then so that okay. was like the baby version but but the next time we went back because we went we all went to moscow another time right yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was also, I believe, the time, if I'm not mistaken, the Infraza would have been with you as a mixer. Yeah. You absolutely. guys got stuck leaving the country. Yeah. Except baggage. Because absolutely. we've gone through ourselves. But I think you guys got, got a, like, in fact, Marco missed the next gig, right? That's he had right. a gig uh, and a jump off gig in yeah. between. And, yeah. Uh, that was that was one of those times, too, where I was I was working. I was working for eddie on a gig and then immediately starting an adrian gig and we overlapped but i i was i was flying away from moscow with adrian and and the slicks and i and and i was i was finished with eddie that day i wasn't gonna do wow so you weren't gig. stuck he was stuck without you yes uh, he was with i know i mean i wasn't gonna be there anyway uh, the next day but now they were stuck at the airport with the crooks 
in in Moscow asking for yeah. Just yeah 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 twenty grand or ten grand or something. Um, no, that's a good 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 memory there. But um, but but Eddie's gig um, from that point on was three MacBook Pros, everything software, uh, uh, everything main stage and Omnisphere and Arturia and all that. And how did that work out? Did that shit crash? You know, what was amazing, and, and I, I love main stage, I use it to this day, what was amazing was it didn't. It was really great. Every once in a while there'd be some 32-bit, 64-bit annoyance with one of the plugins or something. But for, for as much as we depended on software, uh, once in a while a USB cable would, would, would go down. It, it was always simple stuff. One time I kicked the power supply under the table for the USB hub that had like four USBs in it. So th that's the funny part. The software, um, and this is years ago, this is a decade ago and, and seven, eight years ago, uh, was really quite stable. But it, it, it's funny you ask. I never 100% relaxed because you're wondering if it's going to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, dude. As soon as you start to rely on very much backline, even the SBX90 or a not SB, SBDSX, the Roland right. sampler box, sure. it's very solid. But dude, that I get paranoid every gig. What if that thing craps out today? And that's and, hard. Know, with Crimson, we have a spare, but still, you got to go get it. You got to hope yeah, it's yeah. been updated to the thing you changed yesterday. But uh, and, and that's hardware. I I got to really <laughs> emphasize. We had no backup plan. He had these really cool um, uh, uh, cutting edge uh, keyboard uh, controllers. Um, I forget the company, but they folded in half. Yeah, yeah. You'd put them in the, uh, in the overhead if you needed to. Um, they were incredible. They were wow. whole technology um, using um, light instead of physical. Yeah, he was building a whole stage and everything because I was in quite a bit of conversation with Trey as that project yeah. was it, 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 and, it really uh, was cutting edge but, but, but we would say Eddie, Eddie, can, why don't you use why don't we have a workstation as one of the controllers? That way if, a if, fallback. if everything goes south, you got piano, organ, Moog and we can just, and he'd go, no, no it's all going to be this this is what we're doing Okay, you know, and, and so I, I applaud him always that he pushed that envelope and he said, there's no parachute. We're just going and flying now. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, you know, uh, that's another gig. Um, it's 10 years. In fact, I'm, I'm going to do a post about this. 10 years ago was my first trip to Japan. And it was, I'm sure you're seeing on the news, it's 10 years since Fukushima oh, yeah. right now. Oh, yeah. and, and so 10 years ago, I, I remember emailing with marco and we were like we're not going you see what's on the thing we're not going to japan and things settled down by april when we went and and it was still a bit terrifying and the plane was 70 percent empty but um I, i've been thinking back about that that's a decade now yeah i watched some of the clips and and i heard some on npr yesterday some guys that lived through it you know yeah, it's um, that's like ten thousand people, I think, uh, died. That. Is it that many? Wow. Yeah. I oh, think it is. It's of the a tsunami. huge number. Yeah, the, the not not the nuclear stuff, but the tsunami itself. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that that um. No, that really um, uh, devastating tragedy and. Yeah. But the Japanese are so. They're such beautifully calm. To generalize. Of course, is always horrible, but but in this case, yeah, as you know, what a, what a calm, beautiful place to be. I love it. I've been there eight times, and I always think since that little island has been under so much shit for five thousand years, I think they have a genetic kind of like what me worry, you know, <laughs> like you know what I mean. Like they, well, they rebuilt the town. I, I saw some of it where they took a, a nearby mountaintop off and rebuilt and raised the town and yeah. the, uh, the water break, the wall, whatever they have there. They've, um, they've started from scratch so many times. So yeah. take me to um, how you end up with Greg Lake. Did you ever work with John? You worked with John too, didn't you? Beautiful years with John Wetton. Yes. Well, well, all the um, right after the UKZ gig that you opened for. Uh -huh. Then later that year, email from Eddie saying, I'm putting back, I'm putting something together with John Wenton. 
Wow. And, and wow. in fact, in fact, uh, that um, 2011 uh, first time in Japan was maybe the first time with John Wetton. Um, no, actually, it was before. Is this your first time in Japan? My first time in Japan was a decade ago, 20, 2011. Yeah. But some, somewhere before that, we did some shows with Tony, and it was uh, in, in Poland and, and Eastern Europe. And it was uh, Tony and John and, and Marco Miniman right. uh, and um, Alex Makachek. And, um, and, and that was the beginning of working with John. And was, was this when John would have been gaffer taping a pick? Yeah. Did I hear something like he couldn't actually physically? Did he, uh, was it like carpal tunnel that he couldn't hold the pick or? That's, that's exactly right. Um, you know, um, his thumb, he had some, some arthritic stuff. So, yeah, so, so part of the teching was to put a uh, half dozen little pieces of, of electrical tape or gaff tape up on his amp and a couple picks so he would and then set them up off stage also but if he needed to he could run over and attach another pick so um so yeah I got to work with John for years which was wonderful in fact somewhere i have a photograph and video of tony meeting john wow what a what a prog rock fans yeah and i know tony tony really hides holds john in high esteem there amazing and I, I, and I remember going, wait, you guys never met? And they were, they were like, no, no. And and Tony kind of said, you know, I, I think we were both at Nam one time and chicken, but no, this is it. And and wow. And they they went off and had a coffee, and I could just hear them talking as they walked away. Like and Tony, I, I never never got to meet him. Oh yeah, John. Yeah, no, wonderful, amazing guy. You know, we would I have had one interesting experience, which was uh, they were called Asia, right? And uh, sure. we played Santa Monica Civic, and my friend was production manager and had me on stage watching from the uh, from kind of with the monitor side, so I could look in to see it's Carl Palmer, right? And uh, and he kind of brought me in right before the drum solo. He knew the set list, so uh, and that would be, of course, the time I didn't think about this when John gets to come off stage. Right. So I was actually in the position which should have been John's space. So what happens is I see a, a roadie crew guy come up with a robe, uh, ashtray with a lit cigarette and a uh, glass of wine. Wow. And then the next thing I realized, oh, that's John coming over. He gets the robe, glass of wine, cigarettes already burning. Sure. He's got three minutes while we watch the drum solo. That's... But I didn't didn't talk to him. It was neat. Neat sure, sure. One of those moments. Yeah. No, um, no, really great. And we would uh, we would have breakfast a lot in, in Tokyo. So I, I cherish that memory and we got to know him a lot. And, and, and well, that's another question I was going to ask. Do you sleep? How do you sleep? Because um, just the amount of dialogue you put online. Right, right. Uh, there, at my rate, that's hours of day composing right. me uh, stories. Sure. Um, that's why I don't even get online like Facebook that much because it's just a rabbit hole. I don't get anything yeah. else. Uh, Facebook, Facebook, I've I've really pulled back from, and me too. It, it's funny. I'm I'm actually in this period now. Uh, Patreon, which I have to tell people, uh, if you're interested in my Patreon, just it's Patreon slash Andre Chumley. If you spell my name somewhere here. This is a way to fund you and your endeavors. Yeah, patreoncom slash Andre Chumley. Right now, I have about 20 patrons, which blows my mind. I started this thing uh, on my birthday, and it's really been great because. It's which birthday? Uh, just just a month ago. Okay. And, and 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 what's wonderful about it is, and it's a throwback to the patronage system of kind of English uh, uh, European composers. You know Bach, Beethoven, Haydn. You know the whole story. Well, the Chumleys, they might have been. The, they might have been patrons for Haydn. You know, good point. I'm gonna dig that up. I'm sure the all coming back. Thank you. I didn't think of that. If I can find out who was at writing quartets for the Chumley Castle. This thing can be full circle. But but what's cool is I do a couple performances a week. Every Sunday I do an acoustic uh, concert uh, for my patrons. Saturday nights I do a basic synthesizer workshop. Thursday nights I do a thing on looping and guitar effects. Friday nights I'm going to start doing a performance, an electric guitar performance, looping and, and you know experimental. Uh, and then I've got uh, just all these little things I'm doing. And, and you say you do that just for your patrons? So how do you exclude patrons. other people from it? Exactly. Well, my patrons come to my the website. They log in. And, and I send them uh, links to things like this that, that only they can get into. So, okay. so so what I'm understanding, I resisted this for years. A, a good I've been of, resisting it. <laughs> yeah, for years. 
For two years now, my dear friend Paul Bielatowicz, I know I crushed his name again, Paul Bielatowicz, b- b- he is um, uh, the wonderful, incredible guitarist of the Carl Palmer trio. Okay, yeah, I've seen him. And, I've, and I noticed on tour he'd be, he'd have a stack of postcards that he was filling out or, or he'd be filming something and speaking into the phone and telling people where he was. Or he'd come over and interview me as I'm changing Steve House strings. And I said, well, what's this all about? And he's like, Andre, it's fantastic. It's called Patreon. Da, da, da. I have, at that point, 75 people. You know, they subscribe. I write songs for them. I do concerts for them. When I'm on the road, they have exclusive interviews. They get to see the backstage. They get to see rehearsals. No one can access this stuff but them. So it's really like the next level of social media where you have filtered out the trolls and the bullshit and the noise. And it's really just folks who, they love music, they love your venture, what you're doing, and they want to support you. And uh, it's really been amazing because I'm learning that some of the people uh, show up for my concerts every two weeks. They just want to say, hey, I'm going to give you five bucks a month or ten bucks a month. And I'm really learning that um, uh, on the outer edges of this thing is someone like uh, Amanda Palmer. Do you know who that is? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, so she would be an example. Uh, not, I'm not to be compared to her at all in terms of fame or something, but just to set the bar, she's yeah. got 14,000 patrons. So she's got 14,000 people who simply auto debit, auto deposit anywhere from a dollar. Five, ten, twenty, thirty, sixty, a hundred dollars to her every month. In exchange, they get a laundry list of stuff. They get private concerts, workshops, lessons. They get pieces of art that she makes and sends to them. Those are the people sending her like a hundred a month or something. They get uh, one-on-one hangs like this with her, or one on thirty or whatever. But what's interesting is it really clicks in to what these seventeenth-century composers had figured out. It's kind of old school. They had figured out, you know what? I'm writing this piece for the Archduke. And I got so many doubloons of gold for it. It's going to be performed for him at that wedding. And that's it. And later on, of course, we, we this music's written down. Now it's performed. But so so it's this, it's a combination of, kind of this new economy. It's kind of similar to Bandcamp in a way because it's a, it's a subscription. And it's not just charity because I am delivering or, or other people that do this are delivering. I'm delivering performances. I'm delivering my knowledge. I'm delivering workshops. Um, and, and I'm just getting started here. I'm going to do some stuff. Uh, I'm going to do a live uh, stream of writing my book. And so it'll just be me sitting. Well, you just here. see. <laughs> well, I'm, I I do it with. Um, and this also answers your question of how I do so much content. Sometimes I'm a well, big. What are you, go ahead. I'm a big talk text guy. So when you see some of these posts, it's just me. I I talk, which I obviously can do pretty easily, and then I go back, fix some spelling mistakes, fix. It what- misses so much stuff. It takes me forever to fix it. And even sometimes the autocorrect, I swear I looked at that before I sent it. And that is not what I sent when I see it come back. Yeah, I, you know, yes, I've, I've developed, it's gotten better. It's gotten really good. And I've developed. Ooh, what phone are you using? I, I have an, I have a pretty old iPhone. I have a 6S and it's. I've still got a 6 in, in the drawer. I, I moved up to maybe the 11 or 10 and it's, okay. it's, but it's not working for me anymore. <laughs> That's interesting. But the software gets better. I think also when I'm doing this, if I'm sending a text, I just grab my phone or I'm writing a little post and I speak much slower and I enunciate to make sure that such and such, you know, I kind of do that. And uh, at the end, oh, of the I day, don't do that. Yeah, I, I, I usually have my hand over the receiver. Go, Yo, so I was thinking that if you got over by about six o'clock, seven, maybe it doesn't really matter. And I just and then it, yeah. yeah. You, you learn certain words. Um, uh, so, so, so writing my book, which I, I'm, I'm, you know, a bunch of chapters are mapped out and I've written a bunch of it. It's me sitting here with this on talking into Apple pages and watching it go. Grrr. So I thought, oh, wow, these are fun stories. I can tell these stories to my patrons. You wake up one day and you go, 
there's too many stories here. You know, I mean, to have worked with, uh, to work with you, Pat, to work with some of my heroes that I grew up listening to, and but to work with just on the King Crimson thing, to work with Greg, Adrian, and John. You know, the three main voices. To have worked with Tony and Greg and John, the three main bass voices. You know, uh, Boz Burrell's great too, but you know that was just one little slice. <laughs> But um, you know, um, there's too many stories that I got to put them out, and 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 I think uh, we're in this era of music where we got to inspire young people. We got to. You have to. You know. you know, there comes a time when instead of taking from people who know more than you, it flips, and you become the person that has the knowledge, and you have to give back to your community. You have a moral responsibility and a social responsibility, I think. That's it. That's it. Give this. That's it. And, and you know, what are you doing? He's going to, you're telling people your stories that may become their stories. You need to. That's yeah. it. That's it. And I, I'm really upbeat. I have a, a couple of young students. I have a, a lot of young musicians I work with locally here in Asheville. Um, and, you know, I, there's a lot of naysaying on the music biz and stuff. I think there's a whole generation that has figured out a different way to do it. That's they, right. They've got band camp and, and, and SoundCloud, they make their own records. They run, oh, yeah, they run to a pawn shop, get a $200 used laptop, and that is $50,000 worth of 1985 technology. You know, the reverbs, the compressors, the studio. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to realize that. And, and they're, they're adept at using TikTok and Facebook and, and Twitch and all this stuff. And the music's great. I mean, I am. I'm so excited about bands like Bent Knee and Moore Mother and, and uh, Igor and uh, um, Black Midi. Have you heard Black Midi? No. no, no, no. Imagine what's happening is I'm 56 and what's happening is uh, I don't have any kids, but the kind of kid I would have raised is now making music at 22. Yes. 30. yes. And, and so Black Midi. And is, they all have parents like us. Exactly. But Black Midi, imagine kids who grew up with. Radiohead coming out of one bedroom and King Crimson coming out of another one and some Zappa in the basement. I mean, you know, so, so you have all these incredible groups um, and things like like Snarky Puppy or, or Lewis Cole. Do you know Lewis Cole, the drummer? No. I'm not sure. We're going to go home after this. We're going to just all fall in love with that silk. That, uh, what's oh, it's something that Bruno Mars is doing with this amazing drummer. The drummer Silk. It? Okay, uh, I, I love it, I'll check that out. They, Silk Sessions? They call it, some, but they did the video in a pseudo studio, I guess, but it's so good. It's a great track, man. I, leaving I'll, the door open. Yeah, he, leaving the door open. He's a great example of killer band, great songs. So I, I think th there's also this international thing happening. You know, uh, as you know, there's these great bands in Argentina, in Indonesia. Leonardo, to, um, to look around the globe, you know, we've kind of grown up in this culture of England or America. Like, that's all that the music there is, you know. I think that went away a long time ago. You know, I do. I yeah, do. for you and for me and you travel the okay. world. But, 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 but I think it, when you talk to some other fans, especially prog fans and some jazz fans, and, and uh, they're still only looking to those two spots it's kind of puzzling. well i i find that really weird then because uh yeah. peter gabriel was really a gateway drug so if you think exactly. of it it was it was genesis and prog music that exactly. took me to peter that took me to womad that took me to learning about burundi drumming and you, you know would, yeah you would think and and it's funny though i've had a couple discussions with this with people lately and for some people that's when peter gabriel wasn't prog anymore yeah, he went. I, I can't explain it. I'm with you. I have a papa's off. Listen to that Bulgarian wedding music. That is the most prog of amazing. any prog. Amazing. That is yeah. yeah. No, amazing. And 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 so I'm with you. Like when I first heard Shakti, I already knew some Indian music. I knew Ravi Shankar, but it made me figure out who Zakir Hussain was, which then led to soundtrack music, which then led to Rhythm Devils, which then. I'm I'm with you. As soon as I heard of Os Mutantes, I started saying, "Oh, well, how did they put this together?" Uh, and so I think that's something people should be doing. In I really loved that about the KTU gig with with Trey and Kimo and and originally with Samui, that we could play world music festivals. Everything that was so great. So many acts that I saw that it just really wonderful things on these yeah. weird festivals in Portugal or uh, Eastern Europe and. 
it, it's it's amazing, and and the and also the experimental side of hip hop. You know, like MF Doom, who just passed away. Wow, that guy. Wow. Don't know. So exper- again because he's not commercial, so that's not the stuff that gets rammed down our throat. But MF Doom, he just died, uh, sadly, very young, uh, forty or something. Yeah, one of the most experimental weirdo branches of hip hop, sampling all kinds of jazz and soul music, sampling Gentle Giant and Zappa, doing these psychedelic records in the hip hop world. There's another group called Clipping. That's a hip hop group with two guys just with modular synths and pedals doing this. I'm gonna have to rewatch this just to write all this down. My pen died. <laughs> you know, was... what I want people to do is realize. We've really got to take advantage of these new tools. You know, I, I'm alarmed sometimes when I when I talk to people and they don't go look up who's the bass player, who's who's this, you know, um Thundercat. Do you know Thundercat, the bass player? He not by name, no. Okay. He's another guy where um his brother, Ronald Bruner Jr., is a drummer. He played with Holdsworth the last year of Holdsworth. But Thundercat is this incredible bass player who plays with Kendrick Lamar and, and Kamasi Washington and this whole, uh, 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 you know, blowing up area of jazz and fusion, snarky puppy, Lewis Cole. And and you look this stuff up and you're like, holy shit, this is not being written about by the old press. These young people are playing sold out tours and it's super proficient shit. It's horn charts and it's totally incredible, like George Duke uh, reincarnated funk stuff and infusion and it's it's cross gen it's cross genre black white asian latina latina people latinx people uh, you know uh, people people from all around the world doing this stuff and it's kind of just over from the radar and i think the whole prog and fusion kind of thing like all the people on the on the cruise we go to they're not they're not keyed into any of this they're still wondering about some band that's going to sound just like Genesis or just like Tull. 1970. You know. And, it, you know, it, it's that's why I love, again, Stickmen, K2, the things you guys do. You're you're cross pollinating from so much yeah. shit. And like you said, you get invited around the world and to different festivals. And so so I'm very upbeat about music right now. I mean, I, every two days I, I hear of a new band. Um, the, the, you one of, just told me about a dozen, most of which, or dozens, most of which I don't know. And I realize it's because I spend most of my time working on okay. yep. what I'm working on. And my yep. head's down inside whatever it is today. I'm heading into a Cleopatra Records 17 minute Pink Floyd cover. <laughs> okay. So, so probably so, spend a few days on this. You, you know, know, yeah. And, and, and th- those are the things where I go, yeah, you know, that's cool. I love that you're working. But you know, I, I think about it too. For me, cover. I like that I can work in my house, so I can keep active as a drummer Shit, when there's exactly. not other work. <laughs> exactly. No, no. I. It's really a learning experience for me. Yeah. Working on other people's music, it's really just a chance. Thank you for giving me something to let me experiment with. <laughs> I, you know, I hope they. I hope Cleopatra never stops doing another Genesis cover, another Yes cover, another Floyd, because it keeps people working. But. You know, um, I want to hear Igor. Have you heard Igor with three R's? Holy no. Shit. So that, that's one. I'm still wrapping my head around them. That is, you're going to love Igor because Igor is, is glitchcore electronics with heavy metal at moments, with goth, dead can dance, baroque moments, with, with uh, 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 tablas and ouds and Middle Eastern moments. With okay. Eastern European, E-G-G. Uh, Igor, I G O R, except three R's. I, I can't even I can't even uh, describe them. Oh, yeah. scary looking dude. Yeah, yeah, and, and but it goes from you. You mentioned Ivan Papasov before. Yeah. they've got tracks like that, with this crazy East European shit. And then they've got this incredible woman, Laura. Uh, oh, there's some dance involved. What have they got? Dance- Dude, it, it, it's it, again. It's people who have. Stu- oh, he's in a bunch of cans. It looks sort of between Romstein and Stomp and uh, Dead and a ballet show or something. You know, um, and 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 you look and they're playing these massive shows, these massive festivals. 
Yeah. The, right. That's 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 a pretty extreme video. Yeah. That. Okay, I'm intrigued now. But they're they're nuts. And 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 what I love about the the YouTube um, algorithm is you watch a few of their videos and something It'll else take you to somebody else. Some weird Japanese. It's a rabbit hole, and that's why if yeah. I start there, I'll never get any work done. Well, that's the thing. You, you... Back to the sleep thing. You seem like a yeah. guy who who does not sleep a lot. <laughs> caffeine. Well, I'm. Uh, thank you for for saying that. Not just caffeine, though. What's your normal thing? You sleep yeah. five, seven hours a night, or you so, go for nine? So here, here's what's <laughs> funny. I I sleep the best, and I eat the best on tour. I, there's something about that regimented schedule that I I. I hit that bed and I make sure I get six or seven, you know, um, solidly. And I, I, so, and, and, and on a tour bus, as you know, nothing like that black, you know, lightless. Especially if you do earplugs and the whole oh, thing. Oh, earplugs and that nice hum of the bus. So, and then I eat really well, three squares and I make sure when I'm home, sleep is kind of iffy. Uh, sometimes I do the vampire thing, and I'm, I'm up till 7.30, and then I sleep for a few hours. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on sleep and rest right now because it's very important, as you know, the older you get. Um, but, I, but I do make sure that I, that I get my sleep. I eat really well. My exercise is shit right now, but I eat really fantastically. I think I, I used to own a natural food store for 10 years, so, so I know how to eat. And you're in a good spot. You're in Ashland, right? That's, that's a good a Asheville, good yeah. It, it's, Asheville, it's great. Right. Um, and so I, and, and then I do things for natural energy, like yerba mate and spirulina and, and B vitamins and things. So I make sure, but I think it's just, um, you know, uh, uh, uh I'm excited about life when, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm it's probably, hard to sleep sometime, right? Yeah, you're jacked yeah. up about the show you just played or the song you're working on or where you're going tomorrow. Um, having said that, I, I'm. Am I am I a manic depressive? I don't know. I have dark days, especially this year. I've curled up in a ball and not wanted to get out of bed for three days. This well, about year, exactly a year ago, right? Last March, April, this, May, it was like fucking this, depressing, this, dude. This is it. Um, tomorrow, March thirteenth, and I I might do something social media about this, even though I've been staying away from this topic. But one year ago was the big press conference on the White House lawn, with. With uh, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, Roche Diagnostics, and Target. Remember that? And we were told they're going to solve everything. Everything's going to be cool. Still waiting a year later. Well, this is when we're going to have the, the, the vaccines. We're going to be available at the Walmarts, and we're going to do oh, it in the parking lots and all this. It's going to be so smooth and awesome. And this was March. Of course, none of that happened, but uh, a lot of money flowed. But But without going down that rabbit hole, to, to think that it's a year, I've certainly had absolute nightmare times like anyone else, worrying about my career, worrying about how to pay the bills, wondering, am I going to catch this thing like a friend of mine? Well, you you wonder if you're ever going to get to see your, your, your parents or your, you know, somebody that you love that's far away that you may never, that may have been it. That may have been the last time I'll ever see those guys in that band. It's, yeah. May not, may never happen again. No, all those thoughts, man. And, and so, um, the, the yin yang symbol is, is kind of my driving force. And so it's important for people to know lots of dark times <laughs> this year, lots of really, but, but right now I, I'm, I'm excited that, um, I've got some creative outlets, you know, I got a couple of students, I've got this interview thing with make weird music. That's going fantastic. It's fun. Um, uh, and it's a throwback. In the early eight, in the mid '80s in college, I was starting to do some journalism, and I interviewed. My first interview was Gil Scott Heron in 1985. Wow! Yeah. So I kind of I did that for a couple of years. I wrote. You have a recording of that? I do. I do. Funny. Yeah, that that. Probably some samples in there. Some things were said that you could probably pull out to be very <laughs> relevant. I'm. I'm. It's funny you say that because just today, kind of getting ready for this, I said I got to find that cassette and put it up it's it's a cassette so what i'm going to do is put it up and put like just stills of him you know do you actually have a cassette player you trust to put it in i do i'm i'm a big cassette guy i i have three boom boxes that work and i have probably four uh, uh cassette decks including a pro studio um 
uh, one. A, a task. I'm, I, I haven't checked mine in a long. I've got a lot of cassettes and a lot of uh, rehearsal and band cassettes stuff. You talking about sure. stuff that's, that's you know those are the masters. <laughs> you know, I I I, I uh, I'm amazed. I'll pop stuff in from. I'll look at this. I'll be like, holy crap! I recorded this in '77. Pop it in. No problem. It plays. The funny thing with cassettes, there's good ones and there's bad ones. All the Max Cells and stuff that we spent more money on are fantastic. They don't gum up. They don't. And that little piece of uh, of foam, the little piece of sponge, you know, yeah. that, that presses. That's the the one the the companies that that put cheap pieces in there. They all fall deteriorated. Fall. Yeah, yeah. But but any decent cassettes. I'll, I'm amazed, and, and they sound great. Well, the and same for DATs. I'm afraid to put my DATs in a DAT player. I have to really make sure, put two or three in there that I could let be yeah, destroyed. Those, and, those and, are trickier. Yeah, I, I've, I've got two DAT machines, and I've had uh, – there's one really important DAT tape that th – those get a little weird with the mechanism and the door slides and all that. But, but the cassette thing is, is strong. I have just a, when you pull them out and all the tape is, you know, ah, it's unspooled yeah, yeah, and you got to get the pencil and bring it all back. Exactly, in. exactly. But um, I, I'm, I'm. That's one of my projects to do some cassette diving and and you, you raise cassette a, diving. That's a good name for a record. I didn't oh, think I like of that. There's, there's a bunch of boxes right here, and you raise a great point. When you're a creative musician, how how do you have time to listen? Cause I, I can't I, even listen to my old cassettes that we're talking about, really. You know, yeah, I start I, to and I, I'm bored, or you know, right, right. Well, there's a lot of that. I, 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 um, I, I may, I, I listen when I'm doing something else. So, doing the dishes, doing some house cleaning, doing some studio work. If I've got to rewire something or install some modules or something, and I know this is going to take 45 minutes, that's my listening time. I, so, I sneak in these little windows. Um, I'll, I'll, once in a while, I'll listen to the news. I try to compartmentalize that. But that's where I get a lot of listening in. And I try to keep a list. I bookmark stuff people tell me. And so if, if, if I'm not playing or preparing for a lesson or tracking something, or I, if, I, if, if I can't be playing, then I'm listening. That's kind of the, the formula. I've formula. usually got my hands with sticks, and it's actually – it's hard to explain, but I, I can't do other things while I'm doing this and, and try to well, sure, sure. do a drumio okay. gig, you know? But do you, So what do you do? Like, do you have downtime? Like, like, let's say, okay, I got to mic up this drum set that I've just set up today, or I've got to rewire, uh, bring a laptop well, in. I leave the stuff pretty well set up, you know? Okay, I, so there's never... And yeah. In fact, my dream was when I came home a year or so ago was I was going to get enough inputs, which I have now, but I can do about 24 inputs. So I, I can have like two drum kits fairly well mic'd up, you know, but then, you know, but the one kit got bigger. Sure. Uh, one of the things with Gavin in the band, he's got five Tom Toms. I was happy with two Tom Toms. Then I went to three, now four, and I'm trying to double parts with it. It's like, now I got to... Anyway, so it's practicing like that, but I, I can spend an hour or so on a pad these days it, because we're home. Long time on the pad, long time on just the foot, and then the whole drum kit. And then by maybe 11 o'clock or noon, I start to work on music. Music, yeah. And, and today, because uh, I want to work on sounds later with Bill, I'll put those little practice pad plates, the little rubber pads on all my drums. So I'll go out there and start to try and learn the song without destroying my drum kit, you know. And is then there, later today, it'll be the fun thing of doing this Pink Floyd thing is I'm going to try and uh, really zone in on his sounds, you know, ma matches, and then and get some smaller sticks and see if I can actually, you know, actually play as light as Nikki would have right. probably played. Uh, what uh, what song can you say? What song? What song dogs? They sent me dogs. Oh, great, great, that's great. Can't beat that. No, lo love Floyd and and you know some of those cover albums are funny. I have a few of them because sometimes they're so exactly like the record that you're kind of like, wait, who's playing what, you know, uh, but, but they're always, they're always one years ago and the, and the tracks were not put together well. Okay. Uh, so once I inherited the project, I realized why the other drummer left it behind right. <laughs> because the clicks that the track had been punched in. Sure. Sure. So the tempo had actually, you know, there were, there were jumps. Right. Right. But did you, you, playing, ever... you don't quite notice. You just, I can't find it. Right, can't later, find the group. I actually spent the money. I said, "Go to the out reel, give me a click, and let me play the parts we never got." Right, and, all, and I hired a Pro Tools rig. I said, "I got to put this back into this guy's track." And then we see, oh, 
he's put a bunch of edits and right. jumped jiggered the time just a little bit each time it happened yeah yeah that's that's not nice do, do you ever have time when you're just doing like changing heads or backing up some hard drives or something where where you where you can't be playing or, or... well i was just doing it last night i changed about 12 heads okay. uh so do you, li have... do you listen during that what do you do uh actually no because uh uh bill was working in here setting up tracks so we were actually having conversations through the yeah, wall there you go. yeah because yeah. like those kind of things for me changing strings yeah. kind of you know but but but, but you're right uh, most times i i have 30 things people have sent me to listen to and i can't get to it because i'm doing music so you know but uh well yeah man this this has been hilariously fun and 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 what a what a a fun roller and second interview and I and I and I actually had meant to uh, have a microphone so I could do this thing like the old days. Where yeah, yeah. Right, right. I asked the question and I. Well, Bill, I no that that's no it, my friend, just just fun and and an honor and uh, just a lot of stupid stories. I learned more about you and I learned more geography Damn. and uh, little this and that, you know, but sticking the plectrum on the gaffer tape and having them ready i mean you know uh, like the old days i used to just see him throwing picks all the day now i realize oh that you can't throw that thing it's stuck it's a john and, and john, john would pick that bass up and you'd go i just tested that that how is that coming out of that you know he's he's in his hand right he must really attack the instrument yeah yeah but he's one of those guys there's a few of them where you try the stuff out and they come and it's nothing like what you just you know um he had he took the tone and volume knob off the bass who needs it well tony i think pretty much does too doesn't he i, I don't know but that, 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 that i would, think tony that, just needs one knob i, I yeah. mean uh i was with him once when somebody wanted to bring back a bass that they'd made for him and uh it was like a five string or something that something special they were describing tony says don't need it not yeah. not interested and or maybe he told me the story actually and then he came back a year or two later with another act same guy backstage and he brought him a three-string bass okay and just, tony's joke because i was at his house once is he has a one-string bass you've seen that it's a mop you know the uh, right right the old school it's like a disanguni or some instrument yeah yeah but let's let's be let's stay in touch my friend thank you this we will is we will and um I will, what's your what's the what's it look like the next tour when does it you know we're on hold to possibly start working like in uh july yeah i um i just got something for celebrating david bowie which is one of the many groups i've worked with uh looking at something uh end of may uh, well, that's pretty soon exactly so that's penciled in so we'll see what happens um yes just on their website just said to be announced, postponed, because we were supposed to start a tour uh, like this week in Europe. Okay. Uh, so, so nothing definitive right now. Brand X has also said, "Hey, are you available in October?" Well, right now I am. Sure. You know, so there's there's a few. Everyone's penciling. You yeah, know, the whole industry's up in the air, and then everybody's going to start beating. Them. You know, I need that venue, and I need that crew guy, and I want that bus. And exactly, I I think though it, we're we're turning a corner. Um, certainly it's going to be regional i think i think some countries are going to dial this in faster some states are yeah, i'm concerned if uh, my european buddies can even come to america if we want to try a tour in july maybe we'll be good i've had my, i'll get my second shot next week okay yeah I, I'm, uh, but i'm not sure all the guys younger guys have gotten shots right I, i'm 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 just now eligible in our state and the J and J one, which I'm keeping my eye on because it's one and it's been tested yeah. some more variants and all that. Um, that that's pretty, you know, that could happen in the next month or so. Um, but I I, I I think the next layer is going to be the 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 quilt, the hodgepodge. You'll be able to look at the map and go, oh, Indiana numbers are no good, but Illinois is pretty good. So let's go there. And, and I think that's going to be and, and also already theaters uh 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 ticketmaster aeg live nation is looking at this idea of do we require the vaccine to come into our venue that that's a real discussion that you're going to start seeing um and they're really looking at that and and i don't blame them i mean i think the airlines are too 
but I, who I, can I, blame I, them? Because if they can say to customers, you're going to walk onto a plane where everyone's vaccinated, they could do. We don't really even know if the vaccine is going to stop anybody from giving. You know, well, yes. Uh, we need a couple of years to figure out what's actually going to yeah. happen. You're right. The the um the the numbers are getting better every week that that it does stop asymptomatic transmission but they're not sure you're correct there, there's there's a bunch of question marks and here for how long exactly so but 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 along the way if broadway theaters and united airlines and live nation can say hey we know there's some doubt but we are scanning phones we are looking and no one else in this theater is without a vaccine come on in i think that's going to be a a selling point I think so. Even with the, the question mark, um, people can say, well, at least I know this, that no one in here <laughs> is, is, you know, uh, uh, you know, so uh, and, and that means we'll be, you know, it's a weird world, man. I feel sorry for those Uber drivers. Some of the footage I saw the other day, like, fucking hell. I, I got to catch up on that. Just, just yeah, you, know. you don't need to. But yeah. just uh, I've always thought that's a tough gig. That was sort of like when E-Session started. Uh, you know the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uber's. Uh, let's have a, a different, another conversation on that sometime. I've drove Uber for about a year, and it's a mixed bag because you, um, the places where it does well, people have bought homes. You know, like say the first wave of the New York and the LA drivers, because you're just making ridiculous money. But once it gets, once it got too saturated, right? You had a lot of people. Well, I've had great experience with it. It's great. And and two of our kids have driven at different time. Uh, Jeremy yeah. did great, man. I think they helped him get the car, you know, and he, he hasn't had any bad experiences he told me about, but you you just yeah. I just figure you're always one person away from picking up some asshole that, that you know, yes, there's, that you don't there's, want in your car. There's trade-offs. There's trade-offs. On the other hand, you're your own boss. You set your own schedule. You have all these things. So it, it's, but, but yeah, there's definitely been some, fucked up stuff the company has done and, and that kind of thing so um um the whole world economy changes because of this everything music flying restaurants this is it bro this this i don't think we're actually clicking into that enough well, it's a paradigm shift for the whole world just like the black death was just like the 1918 was actually it, it changed everything uh you know and and I think uh, buckle up, folks. There won't be a return to normal. It's going to be a return to different. Yeah, so, that's another good record name. A return to different. To different. Maybe for Al Demiola. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, he's working on something, but maybe we'll keep that. Let's work on a project, actually. A return. Okay, okay I'm going to go, or we'll never stop. You know. Yes, bro. Love you, man. Thank you. And we could okay. talk for hours, but let's do part two. Where I interview you again. <laughs> nah, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Talk to you Ciao. soon. Ciao. Ciao.